Hello. We'll begin with the next question in uh, classical mechanics. Again with the first model, question number 16. In properties of kinetic energy function, the term P2 which is? Now this is nothing but the properties of kinetic energy function term. So over here you have the term, you say that Ri is a function of generalized coordinate and time. Right? Then what you do, you take the usual term, what is kinetic energy T is equal to summation half Mi Ri dot square. Right? So your job is to differentiate this. Substitute the value over here, but when you square it, you get total three terms. Okay. The first term will be only with, like, uh, will be independent of the velocity. First term will contain only velocity, and the third term will be square of velocity. So, in short, over here, what we get is the value of Ri dot. I'll just tell you over here the value of. R i dot is nothing but d r i by d t right and that d r i by d t is summation over g daba r i by daba q j q j dot plus daba r i by daba t because this is the function of q j and t if you get this so when you put the value over here and square it right you get the first term which is daba R i by daba q j into daba r i by daba q k q j dot q k dot that is square of velocity that we call as t2. Then second term will be twice daba r i by daba q j q j dot into daba r i by daba t that will be only velocity. And the th third term will be daba r i by daba t square. Okay? So that's the reason I get the value over here which is t is equal to t0 plus t1 plus t2. So this term will be definitely uh, having the terms which is nothing but square of velocity. So this will have the two terms daba ri by daba qj qj dot and daba ri by daba qk qk dot that's why it is square of velocity. Moving further the non-inertial frames are dash frames. So as far as the last model is concerned, right, where you start off introducing about the fictitious force or the centrifugal force, right, the first sentence or even when we begin with the classical mechanics, we say that the Newton's laws of motion are valid for inertial frames, right, and the inertial frames are un, uh, unaccelerated, right. So over here, the answer for this will be non-inertial frames will be accelerated right and here you do have the diagram as far as where is a0 right when you define the pseudo force or fictitious force term is concerned so the starting of the classical mechanics that why the inertial frames are accelerated frames where the newton's laws of motion are valid but exactly opposite will happen in non-inertial frames which are accelerated okay that's what we need to confirm over here Next question. So we'll move towards the question number 18 now. Next question, question number 18. Lagrange's equations are invariant under dash transformation. So this we have studied in module 1, okay, where the topic where you prove that how the invariance under Galilean transformation, where you prove that f is your gauge function. So what you do over there? You have two frames, inertial frames. One is S, other is S dash. In frame S, correct, we have the Lagrangian L is equal to P minus V. Then we consider the motion of the particle in frame S dash, whose, uh, which is moving with velocity V0 with respect to S. So we have a relation Ri dash is Ri minus V0 T or Vi dash is Vi minus V0. So when you consider Lagrangian in S dash frame, you get L dash is equal to P minus V. Substitute the value of T, correct, where you consider this V i dash, half M V square. So take half M I V I square or V i dash square, 
If you put this value, you will get a term which will be L dash is equal to L plus dF by dt, where f is my gauge function, which is very clear that Lagrange's equations are invariant under Galilean transformation, a straightforward simple answer. Next question is homogeneity of time results in the conservation of. So again, this is model one. There are three symmetry laws, one, two on homogeneity and one on isotropy. Already we have discussed one question. So this is second question, homogeneity of time. So here what we consider? Here we consider that the delta L Lagrangian, change in Lagrangian is equal to daba L by daba T into delta T. Correct. And try and take the value of Lagrangian which is a function of R1, R2, R1 dot, R2 dot, etc. Right. Try and find out the value of dl by dt. Right. So at the end, we reach out to the expression where you get the expression to be 2t minus t plus v. Right. So here, if you take 2t minus t minus v will be t minus v. So over here, we are, uh, sorry, this is minus, so minus minus will become plus, yeah. So 2t minus t is 1t plus v. So t plus v should be energy, yeah. So this is what expression, what we get if you differentiate this, or take a total time derivative, that is called as, so you reach down with this expression. So in short, what we can say, the homogeneity of time results in the conservation law of energy. That is as simple as, so moving forward with the question number 20 now, we will move towards <coughs> question 20. Next question, a force which does not really act on the particle but appears due to acceleration of the frame is called as dash force. This is a simple diagram, here you have a frame S which is inertial which is z, this is x, y, z, I can say, origin is o, which is moving with acceleration a z. Second frame is s dash, which is non-inertial, x dash, x dash, y dash, z dash, origin is o dash. I took point p, right, over here, in the frame s dash, right, and my job is to write the value, so here I write r, so here, if at all you join O dash to P, Rn, O to P, this is R by N. So when I know that this inertial frame is unaccelerated, non-inertial frame is accelerated, that's what it means. So S dash frame is actually moving with the acceleration A0 relative to S, because S is actually have the acceleration A0, S dash does not have, but it is moving relative to S. That's why the force which does not really act will be called as, in short, a pseudo force or the fictitious force. This is the basic definition of the fictitious force. So we'll come to problems in uh, very soon. So this is your simplest question. So can't be real, can't be true, can't be total. Right? So this is what we have understood in question number 20. We'll move towards question number 21 now. Question number 21. A 1 kg stone at the end of a 2 meter long string makes 5 revolutions per second. Calculate force on the stone as measured in an inertial frame. So as good as you have taken a string to the other end we have put a stone and we are trying to move it in a circular motion. So definitely we are going to observe the centripetal force, the formula is minus m omega square r. So over here m we know, r we know, but here we have not got the value of omega. So what is basically omega given as? Omega is 2 pi f. So you know 2, you know pi and f. What they say 5 revolutions per second. Per second is important. So we have to put the value 5 over here. Find this value and then square it, then only you will get the answer. 
So here I can write minus m is 1, omega is 2 into 3.14 into 5 square into 2. Right? If you multiply this, you are going to get the answer to be minus 1972 newton. You can check this value. Correct. So if at all you check the answer, the answer is this. Actually, there is no need to write the sign minus. Not required, even though you write upward, downward, that's a must. But in this case, they just mentioned the values in negative, so it's okay. No problem. But usually the answer force is never written in negative units. But as the all options are negative, we can't write it. Right. So first option. But you cal calculate and check. Hmm? Next is the rotation of the plane of oscillation of dash pendulum demonstrates the fact that the earth rotates about its axis. This is the best possible experiment that is observed in the Paris as I mentioned. There is a huge dome in which the long wire of around 28 meters right, and to which we have attached a huge weight and that keeps rotating. I showed you the video also for that. Okay. So over here, it's obvious that this thing proves that how the earth rotates about its axis. The answer has to be obviously not a simple, not a compound, not a double, but the Foucault's pendulum only. Right? So this is my 22nd question. We move towards question number 23rd. Okay, next equation, question number 23 and 24, both related to the symmetric top. So I can show you in short, the symmetric top like this. Right. So over here, the first question says that if symmetric top I1 is equal to I2 and dash axis is axis of symmetry of the body. So this is a well-known derivation for the Euler's equation for the motion of a rigid body where you get tau1 is equal to I1 omega 1 dot plus I3 minus I2 omega 2 omega 3 then tau 2 and the other. But to get these symmetric torque, what is the condition first? I1 has to be I2 and there is no torque acting on the particles. So which means tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 will be equal to 0. So what will happen over here? I will have to take this equal. So this will become minus, so I can change just the angles, make 2, 3, then this is B1 and this is 1, fine. The next job is what now, try and put I1 is equal to I2, so what will I do over here, okay, I will try and substitute the value, this to be I1, right, then here also I1 and the main thing is for the symmetric top, you need to keep the Z axis or the third principal axis to be your axis of symmetry of the body therefore the answer is basically z axis so here what we'll do we'll write those equation which is i1 omega 1 dot is i2 minus i3 omega 2 omega 3 second equation should be i2 omega 2 is equal to i3 minus i1 omega 3 omega 1 so make this one make this one fine and last equation should be here we will put omega 3 dot is equal to 0 because of the reason we are taking the third principal axis or the z axis is the symmetry of the body fine now the same logic in there itself you have one more question which is the constant angular frequency omega, it is omega, in force-free motion of a symmetric top, same thing, I1 is equal to I2, Z axis principle of the body, everything is same, so there we have to define in the derivation, this omega is equal to I3 minus I1 upon I1 into omega 3, so here itself we will get this, I3 minus I1 upon I1, because here also I have to make this, I1, like here I made it. So I3 minus I1 upon I1, this is the value of, so over here the correct answer is this, I3 minus I1 upon I1 into omega 3. So this is my, in short, the value of the constant 
angular frequency only. Okay, so now we'll move towards the next question, question number twenty-five. Next question. Calculate the fictitious and total force on a body of mass two point five kg relative to a frame moving vertically upwards on Earth with acceleration of ten meters per second. Sorry. So here the formula which we use is F n is equal to F i plus F z. F n is total force. F i is a true force. And F O is fictitious force. So what is fictitious force formula? Is minus m into a z, right? So in knowing the value of f zero, what is the value of mass? It is two point five kg. What is my acceleration given? It's ten meters per second square, right? So obviously the answer will be in short minus twenty five newton. Or we can say F zero is equal to twenty five newton downwards. Never say, as I mentioned earlier, never say a value of force to be minus. Right, right value you must write as you whatever you get it. But in writing you should be careful. The next force is F I. What is F I formula? F R is nothing but minus m into g into n. Where n is the n cap is the unit vector. So what is the value of m over here? M is minus two point five. How much is g? Nine point eight into n. So how much we are getting over here? Direction. So this is coming out to be twenty four point five newtons. Okay. So over here I will again see. Of what? F I is twenty four point five newton downwards. Right. Now my job is to use this equation, so I can say F I is twenty four point five plus twenty five makes me forty nine point five. Five plus four nine. Two plus two. So this is downwards. This is the way we solve it. So twenty-five new newtons downwards. That's what is my fictitious force. The first thing and total force is forty-nine point five downwards. So option C is right. So very important where it is going and what is the value given. Right. Okay. So when they say negative acceleration, then we we'll have to put minus a zero. Then the value will be different. That those problems will take it in a little after after few problems get solved. So this is the way you should solve it, and this is the way you get the answer over here. Okay. We we'll move towards the next question. Next question, similar to the one what we discussed in question number twenty-five. I just change few things. So calculate the fictitious and total force acting on a freely falling body of mass three kg. With reference to a frame moving with downward acceleration, very important term of four meters per second square. Right. So same thing. Total force is equal to the true force plus the fictitious force. So fictitious force is that's what we want to find minus m into a zero. But in this case, my a zero is minus four meters per second square. So here I can write the value m is minus three. Multiplied by minus four, so here I get the value twelve newtons <coughs> exactly. So twelve newton upward is the answer. Twelve newton. Next question. So here, next thing I want to find is F I. What is F I? Minus m into g n. Right. So how much is my weight? It's three kg. Right. So if we multiply minus three into nine point eight, we are going to get the answer to be minus twenty nine point four newton downwards. Right. So after getting both this answer, my job is to 
check exactly how much is the total force I'm going to get. So my Fy is coming out to be minus 29.4 Newton downwards plus my fictitious is plus 20 Newton. Right? So if you multiply that, we are going to get exactly 17.4 Newton, right? So we can say 17.4 downwards, right? So I need fictitious force. So 12 Newton upward, perfect, and 17.4 Newton downwards. So my option is A. Here this is 12 Newton down, 17.4 up. 12 Newton upward, but even 17.4 upward, this will not do, and 12 upward, 17.4 upward, it will not do. That's why the answer is exactly A. 12 Newton upward and 17.4 Newton down. We'll move towards the next question now, question number 27. Again, same question, question number 27. Calculate the fictitious and total force acting on a freely falling body of mass 20 kg with reference to a frame moving with downward acceleration of 6 meters per second square. So almost similar, so it should not take much time. So here I have weight to be minus 20 into minus 6. Right? So answer should be 120 newtons upwards. Fine. Second should be mgn so here i say 20 into 9.8 which is coming exactly around 196 196 newtons downwards right so if at all i want to put the values over here i'll say minus 196 newton plus 120 newton i'm going to get exactly minus 76 newton or 76 newton downwards Almost similar problem what we discussed in the prior question. So therefore, 120 up and 76 down is the correct answer. So this is the way the fictitious and total force. I think we have solved almost three. So it's good practice for you people. Okay. We'll move towards question number 28. This is question number 28. Very interesting. Which is calculate the diagonal elements of inertia tensor for the system of four point masses, one gram, two gram, three gram, four gram, located at the points one zero zero, one one zero, one one one, and one one minus one meters. Right. So basically, this is the inertia tensor topic. G is equal to I omega. Right. This is the derivation which is there in the last model. So over here, basically, what is J? Angular moment. What is I? Inertia tensor. And what is your omega? Angular velocity. So this inertia tensor matrix actually is like this. Ixx, Iyy and Izz. Right? This should be Ixy, Ixz, Iyx. I, Y, Z, I, Z, X, I, Z, Y, and I, Z, Z. What is asked? The diagonal elements of. So we need to find out these three elements. Correct? What is the formula for I, X, X? I, X, X is summation I from 1 to 4 because there are 4 particles. M, I inside the bracket y i square plus z i square which means the formula will be m1 y1 square plus z1 square plus m2 y2 square plus z2 square plus m3 y3 square plus z3 square plus m4 y4 square plus z4 square. How much is m1? m1 is 1. What is y1? So this is my x1, y1, z1. 
x2 y2 z2 x3 y3 z3 and x4 y4 z so i want y1 z1 so y1 z1 is 0 so 0 square plus 0 square how much is m2 m2 is 2 how much is y2 y2 is 1 square how much is z2 c plus m3 how much is m3 3 how much is y3 1 square how much is z3 again 1 square how much is m4 4 how much is y4 is 1 square how much is z4 minus 1 square right so this gives you how much 1 0 square plus 0 square right so here we are not getting any value but here this is how much 2 2 inside the bracket how much 1 so this is only 2 that's plus over here this is 1 plus 1 so 2 into 3, 3 to the 6 plus this is again 1 plus 1, 2 into 4 that is 8, right. So answer is 8 plus 2 is 10 plus 6, 16 gram centimeter square is my answer, right. So only one option it has got 16 gram centimeter square. So but still you can confirm with your I, Y, Y. I just give you the hint, you can try on your own. So this is my i is equal to 1 to 4 mi. The formula should be what? x i square plus z i square. So again, what you write over here? m1 x1 square plus z1 square plus m2 x2 square plus z2 square and so on. And try and get the same logic. Right? The answer should be around 17 gram centimeter square. Right? And the same formula which is used for IZZ, what is the formula? Summation I goes from 1 to 4 MI XI square plus YI square. Okay? For this same logic, M1, X1 square plus Y1 square and so on. And the answer should reach to around 19 gram per centi 19 gram centimeter square. Therefore, the correct option is B. 16. 17 and 19. This is 16. This should come 17. This should come 19. Check it. Okay. Right? Same logic. But this is a very important topic. Inertia tensor. If they ask full matrix, then you need to find out I, X, Y. This should be same. This should be same. And this should be same. That's what is the logic behind finding all the elements of the inertia tensor. By teaching this part by your teachers, they must have told you what is the formula for I, X, Y or I, Y, X or how they are same or even i y z i z y or i z x and i x z how they are same so same formula can be used for that also right we'll move towards question number 29 and 30. next question question number 29 a 2 kg stone at the end of a 2 meter long string makes three revolutions in four seconds calculate the force on the stone as measured in inertial frame so such type of force in inertial frame is called as centripetal force and the formula for that is minus m omega square r. So in this case m is given to you, yes, it's 2 kg stone. How much is r? It's 2 meter long. But only thing over here, critical is omega. What is the formula for omega I told you? It's 2 pi f. So 2 into 3.14 but in this case they have not given you directly revolution per second they said revolution three revolution in four seconds so you have to take it three by four okay so it's almost 0 0.75 this is very critical this would have been three revolution in one second so only directly you can put the value three here but three revolution in four seconds so how many in one second so three four that's what is the logic we have to use over here okay so if you use this formula over here we say is minus 2 into 2 into 3.14 into 0 0.75 square into r is 2 right the answer of this turned out to be around 89 newtons right so we can say either it is 89 newton over here or and the centripetal force, it has to get balanced obviously. So even though you write plus, it in, depending on the option. So option over here is plus. So we'll put the tick for plus. 
again one problem we are seeing the answer we are given in negative but in this case they are given in positive so whatever is the option we have to choose it last question the condition for the given transformation to be canonical by pv which is poisson's bracket what is the condition so over here we know the condition we have solved problems also on that so the condition is qq0 pp0 but qp1 perfect this is the condition or this is my answer qq minus 1 not possible pp1 not possible so looking at all the answer the first answer is perfect over here that's what is the condition for given transformation to be canonical by poisson's bracket okay so here i end up with my total multiple choice questions of around 30 i think this is sufficient because you now have got the idea because there will be few questions on theory few on the problems so maximum problems i covered it over here okay so only if you write in the comment that you want more then only i'll do the remaining 10 15 but i don't think it's required because all the exam is on 11th so concentrate on this this is sufficient okay thank you very much please don't forget to share and subscribe to my channel that's the request again thank you very much